What I'd like to do this morning is talk about unconscious aspects of emotion in particular, uh, because I think these are sometimes ignored, although we've, we've heard a bit about it this morning. Uh, I really want to make that the, the prominent theme of what I'm going to say, because I, I think we have to realize that animals from an evolutionary point of view were unconscious before they were conscious. So consciousness is really the non-unconscious, if we want to twist the language back around. Um, so let's start with the unconscious aspects of emotion, and then we'll see how we can bring consciousness back into it. So the first thing we have to realize is that there are these two aspects of emotion, the conscious feeling, which Antonio talked a bit about and, and Ray talked a bit about, and the body is important in, in what we actually feel. Um, so we have one person feeling anger and the other fear in this uh, uh, depiction here. And, um, in addition, though, we have to realize the bodily expression uh, of all these responses. And as we go inside the body, there are many things we can see going on uh, in Jack's body there. The uh, defense mechanism, the fight or flight response that we've heard about this morning is, is uh, active. Uh, the brain is doing things. The hormones are being released. The autonomic nervous system is active. Muscles are tense. All of this is uh, contributing to the survival mechanism, the, the What's important in this case is uh, uh, if he were faced with a, a predator, um, he would have the, the mechanisms, the energy resources, and the, the wherewithal to, to deal with what he's faced with. Um, now, this is put in our brain by evolution for the point of view of keeping us alive. And unfortunately, it persists into modern life so that even in times where we shouldn't be activated in this way, we can be. Uh, a thought or an image um, that... Uh, can turn this mechanism on and give us trouble and can haunt us for, for decades. People with, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, the simple memory of some event can activate this system for reasons that are completely irrational uh, and unnecessary at the moment, but that are in the brain because the brain has this capacity and it's been wired to, re uh, to respond this way by experience. But what I want to do is address three questions uh, in, in the talk, and one is, what causes these emotional responses? How does the brain detect events in the outside world and produce the responses? Secondly, can the responses tell us about what's going on in feelings? How confident can we be when we look at someone responding in a particular way, knowing what they're feeling? And I imagine this has something uh, to do with questions about art as well. How confident can we be in judging one's external or physiological reactions uh, and, and determining what they're actually feeling? And finally, how might feelings uh, come about? So the first question, the common sense view, which William James identified long ago, is that we, uh, uh, we, we feel something, and because of that feeling, we act in a certain way. I think it's pretty much universally accepted that this is not, uh, certainly not the universal answer to the, the what causes us to respond in a certain way. Uh, we, we know uh, that emotional responses in particular are products of systems that operate unconsciously. After the fact, we often become conscious of uh, what it is that, that's going on in our brain and body. This is not to say that we can never consciously uh, produce an emotion in ourselves, because obviously we can. But in the, the normal situation where you're walking down the street and someone suddenly attacks you, you respond in a certain way before you actually know that you're being attacked and that uh, uh, your body is, is in this situation. So we have mechanisms in our brain for detecting events uh, and, and for producing these responses. Uh, and, and there's quite a bit of uh, scientific evidence that from both psychology and brain science that supports this. Um, it's a long history of research on subliminal st stimulus presentations that can elicit emotional responses. Ray Dolan has done beautiful studies of this. Um, there's a lot of brain research that show exactly how emotional uh, responses to danger come about. And, you know, as David said, my research is primarily focused on negative emotions, in particular fear, and that's really what I want to emphasize this morning because that's what I know a little bit about. So we just have to keep in mind that consciousness is really blind to much of, of what's going on in the brain, and there are many levels that, that this is true uh, and some that it's not true, and I'll get to that in a, in a bit. But from the point of view of how an external stimulus elicits a fear response consisting of autonomic changes and muscular changes and hormonal changes, uh, there's a very simple story about how all this occurs, that there's an external stimulus, 
that's processed by this part of the brain, the amygdala, that we heard about several times this morning. And that produces a, a fear response. Now, that's not to say that this is the only way these mechanisms can be activated or, or generated, but certainly the amygdala is an important part of the story about how external stimuli often elicit uh, emotional responses in us. Now, there are two ways that the amygdala can be activated by an external stimulus, and this has some importance uh, in understanding how we react to things. On the one hand, there's a pathway that um, gets into the amygdala very quickly. In, in the rat brain, we've uh, put electrodes in the, in the amygdala, and we can actually record how fast it, it takes or how long it takes for a stimulus to reach the amygdala. And the answer, it takes 12 milliseconds. So take a second, divide it into 1,000 parts, and the first 12 parts of that second go by, and by that moment, the amygdala is already responding to an external stimulus. It takes much longer for the information to go through the cortex, but through the cortex of the high road, we're able to process much more about what the stimulus is. So an, a good example of a low road response would be if a bomb goes off in this room right now, immediately your, your muscles would tense, your hormones would be released before you even knew what had happened to you. Uh, that would be the low road kicking in. Then you would more slowly begin to analyze what it is that, that's producing all of this and your perceptions would be more complete and so forth. But from the defense point of view, you've protected yourself by responding uh, quickly. Um, we, we've identified these pathways in the rat brain and, and Ray Dolan has done studies that have uh, shown exactly the same thing is happening uh, in the human brain. So um, just to put it in a graphic example, the guy's walking through the woods, he's about to step on the snake. Through the low road, he halts before he uh, actually steps on the snake. This protects him, but if it turns out to be a stick, then he can just keep on uh, walking through. So in, a, in many ways, the amygdala, though, is a, a misnomer because there are at least a dozen different parts of it, and not all of them are involved in these kinds of simple fear responses. You need uh, only two parts uh, in order to have a response to an immediately threatening stimulus like this. You need the lateral amygdala and the central amygdala and connections between them. So the lateral amygdala is receiving the inputs from the external world, it's communicating directly with the central nucleus, and then out come the responses. And that simple story obviously doesn't apply to, to very complex things, but to a, a loud sudden noise or to a snake on the, on the path in front of you, these kinds of mechanisms are probably sufficient to take care of things. So question two then, how can we use these responses that we can measure and that we know something about in the brain uh, to, to tell us something about other people's experiences or other animals' experiences? Obviously, we do this in our daily lives all the time. We make judgments about what other people are, are feeling because this is uh, uh, essential in our social interactions. When you talk to someone, you're constantly judging how they're responding to what you're saying. I'm wondering right now what you're thinking of what I'm saying, and uh, you're trying to figure out what I'm uh, feeling as I'm saying it to you, and so on and so forth. So the question is, how reliable is this? So um, the more general question is, does the similarity of, of the behavioral expression of an emotion equal the subjective experience? So I would say in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. And let's look, look at some examples. In this case, probably, you know, that we could say that there's uh, something similar going on in their two brains. Uh, here, we're, you know, we have some degree of confidence, but we're starting to, to question it a little bit. Um, you know, we're getting to a little on shakier ground. Um, as we go into other animals that are much further removed from us, we simply don't know uh, what to make about what might be going on in their brains. Um, we can take it very far. We can. This is a, a petri dish with a bunch of bacteria in it. Now, if we squirt some acid in there, they're all going to move to the other side. Now, imagine if this were people in a swimming pool and you poured acid in the pool, they would all move to the other side as well. So, is the bacteria and the person feeling the same thing, even though they're responding in the same way? And this is a, a philosophical question that we can't really uh, uh, answer with any definitive uh, conclusion, but I think in the case of the, the monkey, um, we, we feel more comfortable. In the case of another human, we feel much more comfortable than we do in the case of bacteria or even in terms of robots, which can act in the same way as people, but presumably feel nothing. 
So there are deep philosophical questions that we uh, engage every time we make a judgment about what another person uh, is uh, feeling when we interact with them socially. Um, and you know, there, there are people who are very good at deceiving one another in terms of their emotional reactions. And so even in a, in a human where you have confidence that uh, from lots and lots of experience that if a person is smiling, they're probably uh, responding positively to you, there are people who could uh, very easily deceive you. So um, if behavior doesn't really give us the ultimate clue, um, on what basis? In other words, if we're looking across different animals in, in particular, what, what basis can we have some confidence uh, or have the most confidence that we're uh, re reacting the same if we're acting the same? Um, and the answer is similar composition. Now, if we have different kinds of composition, it means that we probably have either different kinds of subjective experiences or no subjective experiences at all. So uh, here's a bunch of... Uh, different creatures, uh, and, and we've kind of gone through this already uh, in terms of the, the um, responses we've been looking at, but which ones are we most confident in, in saying are exactly the same? I mean, this, this is one kind of composition as we look at their external body, but obviously the kind of composition we're most concerned about is brain. If two organisms have the same brain, they're probably capable of the same kind of subjective experience. And if they have different brains, their experiences are likely to be very different or, or maybe even non-existent. So um, the, the brains are different across evolution, but they're not completely different. So there are parts of the brain, um, like the, the forebrain, uh, is, is most different, and the hindbrain, the least different across the, the various classes of vertebrate animals. So, from, so we go from fish through amphibians, reptiles, birds, uh, mammals, and so forth. Um, the hindbrain and the midbrain are the most similar. These are the parts that are necessary to keep you alive, to keep you breathing, keep your heart pumping, and so forth. And the forebrain differs the most because this is the, the latest part of uh, the brain that was added in evolution. And, and within species where you have um, a forebrain that, that is somewhat similar, it's the forebrain, it's the differences in the forebrain that distinguishes um, between those animals. So, for example, within the mammals, uh, we all, have, all mammals have a neocortex, but the neocortex is uh, vastly different as you go through different mammals. So, if, if we could say that, if we could identify the parts of the brain that are involved in consciousness, um, then we might be able to say that which animals have the kind of conscious experiences uh, that are similar and which don't have those kinds of experiences. So where is consciousness in the brain? Obviously this is a, a big question and not a question that we have uh, any kind of uh, conclusive answer to, but there might be ways of reducing the problem in a simple way to ask questions about consciousness um, that are more easily answered than other aspects of it. So it, it obviously depends on what we mean by consciousness, so let's take a very simple example. Um, one, one thing that we have some understanding of is that when, when we're conscious of some external stimulus, uh, we are usually, uh, scientists usually think that that information is present in what we call working memory. Uh, this is sometimes called the attentional spotlight. Uh, some, some people call it access, access consciousness. Some philosophers call it the easy problem of consciousness. But it's the aspect of, of awareness where Here's a stimulus, and it's now in your mind, and you're aware of it. This is a problem I think we, we understand to some extent. So uh, let's think about how, we, uh, how this kind of experience comes about. So we have um, some external stimulus that enters into this part of the, uh, the cognitive system called working memory, um, and it draws upon long-term memories, things we know about uh, uh, other experiences we've had from our own past experiences. Uh, these are called episodic memories, or facts that we've stored, uh, that, that we've built up through our experiences. These are called semantic memories. So when you combine the external stimulus and your memories about that, that are being triggered by that stimulus in your working memory, you can have an, a conscious uh, perception, awareness of what that stimulus is. Um, now, if we add in something else, Adam, Alan Badley, who's the, the father of, of the working memory concept, uh, has recently been talking about something called an episodic buffer. This would be an aspect of working memory where we encode our own 
episodic experiences, again, drawing on the external events and our long-term memories and putting all this together. The working memory is uh, useful in this sense because it's believed to be a kind of system in the brain that can integrate a lot of different things. So you're, at a, you're having a meal it's, and you remember the meal later. You, what you remember are the things that went into that experience, such as the, the taste, but also the, the room, the company, uh, the smell, and all of these ingredients are put together. And working memory is a way of, of kind of putting all that together. So how does working memory work? Um, well, there's a, the highest part of the human brain, the prefrontal cortex, which we heard a little bit about earlier, uh, is essential for working memory. It includes some of these areas that, that Ray was talking about that are uh, the anterior cingulate and so forth. Um, and this part of the brain is what distinguishes um, humans from other primates and also from other mammals. So it's greatest in the human brain. Uh, it's present, but... Um, uh, less developed in other primates, uh, and some parts of it are perhaps even non-existent in other mammals. So uh, this, is, uh, this begins to give us clues about what could be different about human experience if this indeed, if this part of the brain is, is involved. Um, and if we add in the importance of, of language uh, into the human brain and, and into our conscious experiences, because so much of our conscious experience involves the labeling and classifying uh, of experience on the, on, the kind, on the basis of the kinds of words we have to describe those experiences, then we have a lot of ingredients we need to uh, distinguish what a, what a human brain can do that other brains probably do differently or can't do at all. Um, so if, if that's true, then it means that other animals uh, prob might, and in fact probably do have subjective experiences, uh, without, but without a prefrontal cortex and without language, those experiences are likely to be very different. Now, a number of years ago, the philosopher Thomas Nagel asked the question, what is it like to be a bat, uh, saying that bats are likely to have their own experience and it's impossible for us to know what it is because we're not a bat. And I think this is kind of a neurological uh, restatement of that because if the parts of the brain that are allowing us to have these experiences are different in different animals, then the experiences themselves uh, must be different. So let's then turn to the question of how might an emotional experience of an external stimulus come about. I'm not trying to give you an, uh, an all-purpose um, uh, description of how all possible emotional experiences might come about. But again, the, the snake on the path, for example, uh, will, will uh, enter working memory as a perception together with these long-term memories, plus the fact that your body is aroused and, and these body-sensing areas in the cortex that Tony and, and Ray were talking about are activated, will feed into working memory as well. And this representation of, of these things, the stimulus, your memories, and your immediate experience, I think are sufficient to uh, produce at least the rudiments of an emotional feeling, a conscious feeling, about what it is that you're experiencing uh, at the moment. Now, obviously, again, as I said, it depends on what we mean by consciousness. And I've given you a very simple um, uh, version of consciousness, uh, and there are lots of different ways that we can talk about consciousness that are listed up here. Um, and as, uh, these sort of go from the lowest level, from being awake uh, versus asleep, to uh, simple awareness of external events, on through um, uh, awareness of self and uh, awareness of awareness of self and on and on and actually elimination of self and transcendence of self and so on, uh, all of which I think are aspects of consciousness. And what's interesting to consider, and I'm going to skip over a couple of slides in the interest of time here, is of the, the various things that, um, that we can be aware of, which ones of these do we need to be aware of to use those functions? So obviously we can detect external stimuli, uh, and we can be aware of those stimuli as well. So we can be conscious of uh, an apple that's out there in front of us. We can respond to that stimulus, and we can be conscious that we're responding to it. Um, our behavior can be controlled by motivational states such as hunger and thirst and sex and sexual drive and so forth. Um, and emotional stimuli we can respond to. Um, we can control our behavior by cognition and be aware of this. Um, we can distinguish ourselves from others and be aware of this. And we can be aware, aware of ourselves. And we can be aware that we're aware of ourselves. And we can, uh, through various procedures such as meditation, try to 
shut down the awareness of external things and be totally focused internally on, on what we are. Now, of all of these, what do we need in order to, uh, wh wh which parts of these require consciousness? I think very few, because we don't have to be uh, conscious of a stimulus in order to uh, detect that stimulus and to respond to it. Um, we don't have to be conscious to have an emotional reaction to a stimulus. We don't have to be conscious to um, um, be attracted to, to food when we're hungry and so forth. Uh, so as, oops, as we go down the list, I think even to distinguish ourselves from other, we don't really have to be con conscious. We only have to be conscious when we start to be aware of who we are and aware that we're aware of who we are. And if we want to eliminate our awareness, we have to be conscious. But everything else we can do without being conscious. That said, once we have the capacity for consciousness in our brain, it obviously plays an important role uh, once all of these things are happening. So I can have an emotional reaction to a snake on the path before I know the snake is there, but once I know the snake is there, I can also consciously begin to process it, uh, can make decisions about what to do. Even though my initial reaction doesn't require consciousness, my subsequent reactions um, will certainly utilize the conscious experience that I'm having to uh, improve my chances of dealing with the snake effectively. Now, um, we have something here in New York called the, uh, the Center for the Neuroscience of Fear and Anxiety, and this is a program that spans a variety of institutions in New York. Uh, Columbia was part of it at one point, but the person who was there uh, left and, and went somewhere else, so we, we need to recruit a new Columbia participant into this program. Um, but this program is, is trying to understand fear and anxiety from the level of cells and synapses in, uh, in, in animal brains all the way through people who have, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and we're trying to understand what sort of circuits in the brain are responsible for all this. Um, and in, as we do this, we, you know, I don't want to emphasize too much that the amygdala is the sole participant in all this because it's only one of many participants. Some of the other areas involved are regions called the hippocampus, which play an important role in memory, but also in contextualizing fear. Uh, and the prefrontal cortex, especially the medial areas, which regulate the amygdala. So with these ingredients, we have what we need to begin to think about pathological fear so that, a, uh, for example, a PTSD patient who is at the sound of a car backfiring, which sends him back to Vietnam, uh, is having a contextually inappropriate um, uh, fear response. And we know that, uh, that, that stress and stress hormones can damage the hippocampus and weaken its ability to contextualize fear. At the same time, stress and stress hormones can also impair the medial prefrontal cortex, causing them to be less capable of, of self-regulation of our fear responses. And finally, the same hormones that can weaken these two control, control structures can actually enhance the role of the amygdala in detecting danger and responding to danger. So with all of those uh, particular aspects of it, we have all the ingredients we need to create pathological fear. And what we're trying to understand is uh, whether various forms of therapy can alter uh, these pathological changes. For example, let's say we have a patient with potentiated fear who has a, an excessively strong amygdala response to uh, a, a mildly threatening stimulus. We are giving these people uh, comparisons between some people will receive uh, drug therapy and others cognitive behavioral therapy in an effort to see which uh, is more effective in reducing this kind of uh, amygdala reaction uh, to danger. Now, you know, it's even if, we are, if we're capable and successful in understanding these negative emotions and helping people reduce the negative emotions, um, you know, successful treatment of, of fear and anxiety doesn't necessarily make you happy. You can spend a long time in therapy and maybe succeed in relieving anxiety or depression, but that doesn't necessarily make you happy. So we, we, have, to, um, we have to think about other things that are, are the, the key to happiness. Uh, and this is an important area of moving towards the future because a lot of the work in neuroscience is focused on the negative emotions and we need to also 
uh, turn towards the, the positive emotions as well. But certainly we can't be happy unless we can control negative emotions. It's simply not the, uh, uh, the complete story or the complete solution. So what we need to do is uh, we've learned a lot about how the brain works and how the emotional brain works. We have a long way to go, uh, and I, I hope that uh, we can do this so that Jack can go from this to this. <laughs> Thank you.